Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Okay, well, where we got to yesterday was um, we looked at Luther's discovery on justification. And uh, what I want to do to start with today is really to see, where's he getting that from in the Bible? So what's the Bible's view on justification? What does justification mean in the Bible? Now, we can think quite simply just about what... Now, do you remember we saw Augustine said to justify means to make more and more just. Yeah? So when God justifies someone, he just makes them increasingly loving in heart. He pours his love into their heart, and they're more and more just from the heart. Well, is that how the word justify works in normal language? If someone comes up here and screams at the top of their voice, Get out! And I say, excuse me, could you just justify that action, please? Now, if they say, I just felt like doing it, it was quite fun. I'd say, you've not really justified what you just did. If it's because they say, there's a whopping fire there, then I go, okay, you've justified what you've, what you've just done. E.g., you've shown it to be right. You've not done anything to the action, you've shown the action to be right, Yeah. That's what the word justification is all about. Justification is an assessment, a pronouncement that something's right. It's a verdict that something's right. So that when God justifies us, it's an announcement that we have this righteous verdict put on us. It's not about a change of our heart, about changing something within us. So in the Bible... What I want to show you now is the righteous person is not the person who's never sinned or the person who does lots of good works. Rather, in the Bible, the righteous person is the sinner upon whom God has pronounced the verdict righteous. Let's have a look at Romans 4. We're going to have a little bit of time in Romans today. Romans 4, I just have a look at where Paul quotes the psalm, Psalm 32. Romans 4, uh, from verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So it's not that the saved or blessed person is a person who has no sins. It is that their sins are not counted against them. And that's why Luther could say, with his shocking phrase, do you remember? He said that the Christian is simul justus et peccator. Simultaneously just, righteous, and a sinner. Because they are a sinner at heart, but this verdict has been pronounced on them. Now, what went wrong for Augustine? The reason Augustine said justify is this process of becoming more and more just is that basically Augustine was working on a dodgy Latin translation of the New Testament. And it really it was an awful translation. Um, and he was working on this dodgy translation. I mean, some of the other... Um, ways the Latin went, is when, for example, Jesus said, repent, in Matthew 4, the Latin translation had him say, do penance, which is quite a different thing, isn't it? Not repent, e.g. change your heart, but go and do some act of penance. And so people were going, well, all right, there's the sacrament of penance for you. There you go. It's in Matthew 4. So that's the translation Augustine's working with. But it's just not where the Greek New Testament's going. 
The word justify simply doesn't have that connotation of changing someone. In fact, um, if there are any uh, Greek geeks here, um, if you're not a Greek geek, just shut down for a second. But if you are, if you want to say making righteous, making someone internally righteous, rather than declaring them righteous, there's a different set of words you can use in the making justify word group. Um, you use an adzo ending rather than an ao ending. It's, it's, uh, if you're not a Greek geek, don't worry about that. But basically the deal is... There's a totally different way of saying to declare someone righteous, verdict, and to change their heart and make their heart more righteous. Does that make sense? Yeah? That there are actually there are totally different words you could use for these things. And when the Bible talks about justification, it's a declarative word. It's about a verdict of righteous being said. Now, this in fact is actually now... Seriously, they're not in April Fool's anymore. This is seriously now admitted by Catholic theologians, even though it wasn't at the time of the Reformation. So let me show you. Here's what uh, Leslie Rumble, uh, Father Leslie Rumble. Um, I haven't got a very later, a much later picture of him. This is the best I've got, sorry. Um, and he writes in the Catholic magazine This Rock, um, This Rock referring to Peter, not Christ. He says this. He says, now, it's quite true that Paul made use of a word, the justification word, which in the Greek language had the technical meaning of legal acquittal. And if the word could have no other meaning than that, one would scarcely dispute the interpretation of justification, e.g. Luther's, as implying no more than to be counted as righteous or not guilty in the sight of God. But alas, Luther had not the advantages of modern scholarship Luther belonged to an age when it was thought that the real meaning of the New Testament could be best ascertained by discovering the exact sense of the Greek language in which the books were originally written. Oh, Luther. Come on. Come on, man. You should know better than that. But, Rumble says, he rejects that understanding of justification on the basis that, I quote, the whole religious outlook takes precedence over the fine print. So religion goes with rumble, even if the words of the Bible don't. I mean, I say that now, but I've heard this kind of arguing going on in evangelical circles the whole time, haven't you? You know, people, people go, obviously the text can't mean that. It can't do. Well, that's the word justification. It's declarative act. But undergirding all that, undergirding that understanding, there is a whole different view of the grand sweep of reality. And that's what I want to look at now. Luther, by getting what Paul is saying on the word justification, has had to change his whole understanding of how reality functions. So that's what I want to show you now. So, let me, it's April Fool's Day, here's my April Fool. Do you know who this is? Someone got it straight away. Um, the, did I say Welsh theologian, Pelagius? And uh, Pelagius was a Welsh theologian. Um, and um, this is, do you know what film this is from? This is a clip from a film. Uh, do you know who this boy is that Pelagius is cuddling like a lovely old man? Yes, King Arthur. This is the film. If you've not seen it, go and see the film King Arthur. It's not the best of film. This is the sort of film. I've watched it a couple of times with my wife, and I always annoy her because it's all just over to Because Pelagius is the hero in this film. He's just lovely in this film. And King Ar- he's King Arthur's mentor. Because Pelagius is saying, hey, we're all free, man. And King Arthur goes, oh, so Britain should be free as well. You can see the logic, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's profound stuff. And, uh, and there's this real nasty bishop in there called Germanus, and we all go, Sss, every time. And every time we've watched the film, I, I say to my wife, Beth, I go, oh, Germanus was one of the most wonderful evangelists this country has ever seen. He brought so many Britons to Christ. He was a great guy. And she's always, shut up, let's watch the nice man kill another Saxon. <laughs> but anyway, so there's a slight perversion. Anyway, this is Pelagius, um, and he's the... 
freedom guy, the theologian of freedom in certain senses. Now, he's the guy that Augustine took on and took down. So what I want to do is just show you a little bit. We've seen how Augustine fluffed it a couple of times on a few things. We'll now see Augustine in uber cool mode and watch him move against Pelagius. You watch him circle around him in the net and then... Right. Let's see. What is Pelagius' argument? What's Pelagius saying? Now, see if you like this. It's going to just sound lovely. Okay. According to Pelagius... Salvation and damnation are all determined. It's all up to you. It's just an individual thing. So look, it's not that you are saved because of any kind of connection with Christ or anything. It's not that you're damned by any connection that you've got with Adam. Gosh, I mean, how old-fashioned would that be? No, no, no. It's that... You're damned if you copy Adam in his sin. So Adam sinned, and all right, he was judged by God. Now, if you copy Adam, you'll be judged like Adam was. And Christ was a righteous guy, and if you copy him, you'll be righteous too. See the logic? So Pelagius, and here's the bit why everyone loves Pelagius. Pelagius says, because the thing is, Babies are innocent. They're really cute, aren't they? Babies, they're completely, they're born innocent. And you see why everyone loves it. They go, oh, Pelagius. No. Um, it's because babies are innocent. And, but the problem is that they start copying Adam. So, it's all about the individual. It's all down to what you as an individual do. Now, flick over the page of Stin Romans to Romans 5. Because this is where Augustine went in responding to him. Particularly Romans 5 from verse 12 onwards. Let's just see some of the key bits. Romans 5 from verse 12 onwards. Do you see? Sin came into the world through one man. Do you see this is the whole tenor of this whole passage here? Um, Let's um, flick on. Verse 18. The whole passage is about this, but one trespass led to condemnation for all man. One act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all man. Do you see? By the one man's disobedience, as in Adam's, the many were made sinners. By the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Yeah? So, Augustine comes back with Romans 5. And says, no, no, no. It's not that salvation and damnation are all down to the individual. Rather, God deals with all humankind through one of two men. In fact, there are only two men, says Augustine. Adam and Christ. And everyone is dealt with through one of them. Yeah? Now, how did Pelagius come back on that? Pelagius came back. Pelagius wrote his own commentary on Romans 5. So this is his now in the red corner move back on Augustine. Pelagius said, no, 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 no. What's going on is Adam sins. He's punished for his sin. But what happens is it's not that somehow when Adam sins, we're cursed and found guilty because of his sin. It's that... We've copied Adam. So one trespass leads to condemnation for all men just because we copy the original sin. Does that make sense? I'm born innocent, completely free, but I just choose to follow Adam. Whoops. So damnation happens when I follow Adam. Salvation happens when I copy Christ. And that, said Pelagius, is why God gave the law. God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, and so on, so that by obeying that, you can achieve the perfection God wants and be saved. Now, if you ever hear Pelagius and Augustine talked about in anything kind of like 
popular circles. Pelagius is always the good guy. Um, because he's a baby lover. And Augustine clearly eats babies. I mean, he's just... I mean, it's, babies are guilty? What are you on, man? You know, but Pelagius, he's very optimistic in humanity. He's going, look, we're free. We can just, you know, we can choose to copy Adam, choose to copy Christ. And so it's a kind of self-help religion. You just do it yourself. And together, if we really pull ourselves together and go for it, by self-help, you know what? We can save the planet. Self-help, save the planet. No wonder it goes down well, eh? So, Pelagius goes down well, but in actual fact, it's Pelagius theology that was the really chilly, cold one. Because Pelagius was placing a crushing weight of responsibility on the individual. Imagine if that's the message you do here. By the way, mate, you've got to do it all. Salvation, your call. Go for it. It's terrifying responsibility. Now, here is Augustine's main punch against him. It's said that um, apparently when Mike Tyson would punch you... It was like being hit by a motorbike going at 70 miles an hour in the face. Oosh. This, uh, and Augustine punched way harder than that. Here's Augustine's punch. Augustine says, Pelagius, you are just impossibly individualistic. Because you're saying each man is an individual. Each person is this self-defining, self-determining, self-destiny-giving island. And Augustine says, now hang on, that is unjust and incredibly cruel. Particularly, he says, think of the handicapped. Are you saying that they have their handicaps because of their own sin? That's the consequence of Pelagius' position. Youch! That if everyone is simply responsible for their own sin, there's no knock-on effect from Adam, we're all just self-determining individuals, the handicapped are handicapped as a curse for their own sin. So instead, Augustine said, no, no, no. Mankind is not this vast throng of individuals. Mankind is made up of just two persons, Adam and Christ. There are only really two men, Adam and Christ. And each of us is a member of one of their bodies, which is part of their bodies. And so we're dependent for our fate Not on ourselves as individuals, because we're not individuals. We're dependent on the fate of the head of whichever body we're in. So we're born from and in Adam. And so we share his nature, his guilt. Here's how Augustine put it. He said, we all were in that one man, Adam, when we all were that one man. Now, here's where you can start seeing reality shifting slightly. We all were in that one man when we all were that one man. Now, what Augustine's saying is saying that basically you've got just one man in existence, yeah? Only one man exists, Adam. No other humans around. No other humans exist. You've got this one man. And then he propagates himself. Eve comes out of him, and then they propagate humanity. So humanity physically comes out of them. Yeah? So that Adam's children really are chips off the old block. Yeah? I mean, they really are. You got the one block of humanity, Adam, and then it's like you sort of take a bit out of Adam, and that's. Abel and Cain and Seth, yeah? And so that all humanity is there in Adam and just flows out of Adam, as it were. Does that make sense? Yeah? Let me um, give you a rubbish illustration, then a good one. 
My rubbish illustration. Why am I giving you this one? Um, my rubbish illustration. It's a bit like humanity is like an acorn. So you've got the whole oak will grow out of that little acorn. So you have Adam, the acorn, and the whole oak of humanity, all the different branches of humanity, grow out of that acorn. So what you do to that acorn, you do to everything, to the whole oak. That's my rubbish illustration. Here's the cool one. Hebrews 7. Now, this one can take a little bit of time to get your head around. Um, But, um, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Now, what's going on in Hebrews 7 is, is thinking back to Genesis 14. When Genesis 14, Abraham had gone out and um, whacked a load of armies, been victorious in a battle. And then he met Melchizedek. And Abraham gave some of the plunder that he got from his victory to Melchizedek. Yeah? Yeah? Now, Abraham is an ancestor of Levi. So Levi doesn't actually exist yet. You with me so far? All happy with what's going on, right? Abraham gives some of the plunder of his victory to Melchizedek. Now, here we go. I think we just dive in at Hebrews 7 verse 9, otherwise we'll get confused. Hebrews 7 verse 9. One might even say that Levi himself... Now, remember, Levi hasn't been born yet. Doesn't exist in Genesis 14 yet. He's four generations still to come, we'll say. Levi, who receives tithes in Israel... um, Levi's the priestly tribe, so people would give tithes to the priestly tribe. He paid tithes, he gave some of this plunder through Abraham... For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. (laughs) What? He was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. I love stuff in the Bible. You go, that is just loopy. It's cool, isn't it? But, But what he's saying is that Abraham gives money to Melchizedek and Levi, who still, as it were, he hasn't been born yet, it's as if he hasn't come out of Abraham yet. He's a chip off the old block, but he hasn't been chipped off yet. Yeah? And so, because Levi's, as it were, still in the body of Abraham, it's as if he does what Abraham does. Yeah? So it is with Adam. Adam is all humanity. So when he does what he does, we all did it. We were all in that one man when we all were that one man. When Adam sins, all humanity is affected so that his children are born not only with his guilty sinful nature, they actually are born guilty of his crime because they were there participating In that crime. That's Romans 5 logic. That Augustine's trying to bring out. So do you see? So we're all born in Adam. We all come from him. We were all there. Implicit. Made guilty in that act. So salvation is to be reborn. From and in Christ be taken out of that humanity, grafted into a new plant, to be part of Christ's body and so share his righteousness. And now, in Christ language, just is dominating the New Testament, isn't it? Think of the amount of in Christ language you get to see in the New Testament. You get to see you know, Jesus talking about himself as the vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches. You know, are you in me? So what's true of me, therefore, is true of you. Or think of Paul's letters in Christ. Comes up again and again and again. Just look at, say, Ephesians. If you look at Ephesians, you just see that the the, the language of union with Christ, of in Christ, just dominates. I think there's nine times you see in Christ, just in Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, so that... Christ 
is the blessed one. We're blessed in him, through union with him. There's no individualism going on in salvation. Now, when... When the reformers were talking about finding salvation in Christ, basically this is a way of talking about saying salvation is found in Christ alone. Salvation is not my thing, it's Christ's thing. Righteousness is not my thing, it's Christ's thing. Let me give you um, another illustration, this time from... John Calvin, we'll meet him a little bit more in a bit. We'll get to know him. So if you don't know who he is, don't worry, we'll get to know him in a bit. John Calvin put it like this. Um, This is his kind of illustration of how being righteous in Christ works. He says, It seems to me that Ambrose, another theologian guy, well dead, um, (laughs) Ambrose beautifully stated an example of this righteousness that we have in Christ in the story of the blessing of Jacob. So Ambrose said that Jacob did not himself deserve the right of the firstborn. Remember, you've got Jacob and Esau. Esau's the firstborn. So Jacob's not the firstborn. But Jacob conceals himself in his brother's clothing And wearing his brother's coat, which gave off an agreeable odour. Do you remember remember Isaac liked um, the smell of the field? (laughs) Uh, The fields around me at home don't smell particularly good. But anyway, they obviously did. And so he he thought, you know, Esau, he smells like a real man. He smells of the field rather than that namby-pamby Jacob. But so Jacob, he hid in his brother's clothes, and so, smelling like his elder bro, he ingratiated himself with his father, so that to his own benefit, Jacob received the blessing while impersonating his elder brother. We, in like manner, hide under the precious purity of our firstborn brother, Christ so that we may be attested righteous in God's sight. And this is indeed the truth. For in order that we may appear before God's face under salvation, we must smell sweetly with Christ's odour. Our vices must be covered, buried by his perfection. It's a good illustration, isn't it? You see, Jacob hides under the clothing of the firstborn. Now, with that in place, think through what you'd say to this. When the reformers were teaching this stuff and saying we find our righteousness in Christ, Rome said, now hang on, Martin and gang. Hang on. You're saying that God treats you as righteous even though you're not actually righteous. Yeah? You're saying you're simultaneously righteous and a sinner. Well, that's God lying, isn't it? That is a legal fiction. God's treating us as if we're righteous, but actually we're not at all. What's God playing at? See how this puts the lie to that? Because it's not a legal fiction at all. The reality is Christians are found in Christ... And in Christ, we are clothed with his righteousness. It's a real thing. There's no fake game going on. It is that just as Adam propagated himself by his seed, and we were born out of Adam, so sharing his status, so Christ has propagated, produced us by his spirit, so that we came out of Christ. We were in Christ All his righteousness is ours. We're part of his body. We're found in him. His is the righteousness. God's not pretending. He sees us in Christ, for we really are in Christ by the Spirit. When the Spirit makes us born again. Being born again is to be born again in Christ. So do you see, here's what's going on then. Let's just quickly try to pull it all together so we can see it. Here's what's going on. It's that, on the cross, Jesus bears the death penalty of sin for us. So our sins are placed on Christ, 
And the wrath of God is poured out on Christ on the cross for our sin. But then, check out 1 Timothy 3. So sin is dealt with on the cross... And then what? 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great is the mystery of godliness. Christ was manifested in the flesh, and I've got here, vindicated by the Spirit. And the footnote says, justified by the Spirit. Christ was justified. Eh? Exactly. Christ was justified. So what happens is Christ bears our sins on the cross, but he was never guilty of those sins. And so God raises him up and his resurrection is his justification. His resurrection is the father saying... This is my son, the righteous one. He bore sins for others, but he himself is righteous. He's justified by the Spirit in his resurrection. He's declared to be the righteous one in his resurrection. Now flick on to Romans 4. Romans 4. Verse 25. Christ was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Yeah? So when he's resurrected, that's him being proclaimed to be the righteous one. He bore sins for others, but he himself is actually righteous. He's... He's declared righteous in his resurrection, but since we are united to him in his resurrection, his resurrection is for our justification. So it's like this. Adam sins and produces us from his seed. seed. Christ is declared righteous in his resurrection, having dealt with all sin, And then he produces uh, us from himself by his spirit. So because we're united to Christ, the declaration of his justification found in the resurrection applies to us. The father says, this is my righteous one, the one I raise up, and we're found in him. Which is why... Luther talked about, as we saw yesterday, our righteousness being an alien righteousness. Our righteousness is not something we have within ourselves. Our righteousness is something that clothes us. It's in Christ. It's the sort of thing you get to see. Do you remember Genesis 3? You can flick to it if you want. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve... They try to clothe themselves with pathetic fig leaves before the Lord. Youch. That doesn't work. So what does the Lord do? The Lord clothes them properly. That's salvation. The Lord clothing us. Now, I've got to show you possibly one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Isaiah 61. (laughs) I love Isaiah. Isaiah 61 is such a naughty verse because... um, (laughs) because <laughs> Isaiah 61 um, it's one of those ones that's got an immediate oh that's lovely and then it sneaks up on you from behind you go oh the whole new things I didn't see going on in there so Isaiah 61 um, verse 10 here's how salvation works Isaiah 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me 
with a robe of righteousness. Yeah, do you see? The righteousness is external. There's our security, not found in our hearts, but found externally. That's the easy bit. Here's the trick bit of Isaiah 61. Who's speaking in Isaiah 61? Do you see it? Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Ring any bells? It's what Jesus quotes, isn't it? In Luke 4, he says, it's me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do these things, to proclaim liberty to the captives, an opening um, of the prison. And, and you just read on. He's the one who's going to... Jesus is the one who proclaims the year of the Lord's favour, the day of the vengeance of our God. And look at verse 8. I, the Lord, love justice. Yikes. You don't, you don't want to say that in a synagogue. No wonder he's going to get lynched. He's the one who says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Christ is the one clothed in salvation. So it's not even that a clothing, as it were, is on us. The clothing is Christ's. Our righteousness is only in him. Yeah? My righteousness is nowhere here. It's all in Christ. But totally mine if I'm found in him. That's right at the heart of what you need to understand to get what Luther and Calvin and the crowd were saying. That we are found righteous only in Christ and then it all makes sense. And what I want to see a bit tomorrow is how when people have dropped out in Christ stuff, and they do it so often, then it all starts looking a bit silly. Then assurance starts going out the window. People start feeling less secure about their salvation. People start thinking... This doesn't work. It's all a legal fiction. But that's where the reformers were coming from. We're found righteous in Christ. Okay. Now, with that understanding, you're all happy with that understanding in place, yeah? You're all with me. Now, hang on to that as kind of foundations. And now what I want to do is just move on a little bit to go, okay, we've got our foundations there. Let's now look at the two most important debates in the Reformation and look at how some guys who didn't like this took it on and what was the biblical response that was given out. Yeah? So the idea is, by looking at a couple of debates, we're trying to sharpen our understanding of what's going on here. So we've got a basic grasp of it. Now let's pile in and just clear up the picture a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Right. Our first debate is between these guys. Now, you know, cheery chubby Martin. Here he is. Um, Hick. Um, There he is. Um, And this guy, who does not look amused, um, this is Desiderius Erasmus. Um, Now, Erasmus... um, engaged Luther in... Possibly the most significant debate of the Reformation. It was absolutely critically important. And Erasmus was the guy, you need to know, Erasmus was the guy who'd actually produced, published the Greek New Testament that got Luther converted. Do you remember when Luther read Romans 1.17? He found that stuff out about the righteousness of God. It was through... Erasmus' publication of the Greek New Testament that he read it. So Luther felt quite indebted to Erasmus. Now, these guys, they were both ex-monks from the same monastic order, in fact. And they both wanted to reform the church. They both wanted to do that. But what they meant by reforming the church looked very different. So for Erasmus... What did reforming the church look like? Reforming the church for Erasmus basically meant give the whole thing a nice moral bath. We all need to do a little bit better, clean things up, get rid of the corruption, you know, less money changing hands, uh, everyone be a little bit more honest and nice. That'll do it. That'll crack it. And so... Erasmus wanted popes to be a little bit nicer. 
stop all this selling of indulgences stuff, because that's, that's not good. And so he thought, now hang on, Eras- Erasmus thought, Luther's going a bit far when he says, no, no, I don't even want popes at all. And Erasmus just wanted to clean up the Roman Catholic system. He just didn't understand that Luther just wanted to get rid of it all, change it entirely. He wanted to see an entirely different biblical means of salvation. And so, just a few years after Luther had got the Reformation going, 1524 if you want to, Erasmus wrote on the freedom of the will. Does that remind you of anyone already? On the freedom of the will. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Now, Erasmus' argument was this. Erasmus said, of course Luther's right. Of course he is. Of course Luther's right. Of course we can't really earn merit before God. That's true. Well done, Luther. But I wonder if Luther's gone a little bit too far. I mean, is it really true that God won't reward a good deed? No, I mean, surely he'll reward a good deed. Yeah? Because Erasmus purred. God, you see, he's he's like a loving father. And when a toddler stumbles towards his loving father and does something a bit rubbish, the father smiles on that and takes it as something more valuable. Takes, you know, some... My daughter daughter does these um, little drawings in which... um, I'll say, go on, draw Jesus then. No, I don't, that's, that's wrong, isn't it? What do I do? I, I say, draw daddy. <laughs> draw daddy. And she'll just go, there he is. And she'll just scrawl some absolute rubbish lines, but I find it really sweet. Now, Erasmus said, it's just like that with the Lord. We do some little bit of rubbish, and he looks at it and goes, no, that's well done. Well done, that's lovely. You see, Erasmus... He liked to position himself as the wise man of the world, that he was the guy who, he was above these petty, crude extremes. The smaller minds couldn't see this Rome on one side, the Reformation on the other side. I'm in the middle. I can hold it all together because I'm more clever than all of you. So he said, yeah, Luther's right to uphold God's grace, but God's going to reward a good deed. He simply didn't understand that Luther placed all his certainty for salvation in Christ and not in his own performance at all. Now, the difference really came from how Luther and Erasmus understood what Christianity is. Because Erasmus was the sort who was always saying, ah, you know, the Bible is really obscure and... The unwashed masses, they're just not really going to understand the Bible. So what you really need is a clever guy like me to tell you what it's all about. And if you've got me to tell you what it's about, then it'll make sense. And in fact, there are quite a few things I don't understand, but that's because the Bible's a really obscure book. So there are quite a few things. I mean, there are things like Trinity in the Bible. What's that about, eh? Um, things about how God works in salvation. Well, the Bible's just left it all very obscure for a good reason, but let's not get bogged down in all that kind of stuff. Let's not worry about that. Let's just get on with the business of Christian living, eh? Let's just get on there and do it. Here's what Erasmus said. He said, The sum of our religion is peace and unanimity. But these can scarcely stand unless we define as little as possible. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, you will be more united, but round what? Here is what Uncle Jim says. Christianity says, sorry, this is um, Professor James Packer, sorry. (laughs) There's just no respect, is there? Sorry. The great Professor James Packer says, Christianity to Erasmus was essentially morality with a minimum of doctrinal statement loosely tacked on. Luther's attitude was very different. 
To Luther, Christianity was a matter of doctrine, of belief, first and foremost, because true religion was first and foremost a matter of faith, and faith is correlative to truth. Christianity was to Luther a dogmatic religion, or it was nothing. Erasmus' conception of an undogmatic Christianity, who cares about Trinity, who cares about how we're saved, that Erasmus' airy indifference to matters of doctrine seemed to Luther as essentially unchristian as anything well could be. Now, Erasmus, when he wrote on the freedom of the will, he was the most revered scholar in the world. And because Erasmus was so eminent a figure, Luther actually read on the freedom of the will. Now, Luther had like 100 polemics against him a, a day. Usually, he'd just read like a few lines of it, and then he'd use the rest of the polemic as toilet paper. Seriously. But Luther actually read this one all the way through. Now, it looked like at the time, with Erasmus being so highly regarded, with such a great scholarly reputation, it looked like Erasmus was the heavyweight. But Erasmus was no theologian. And in this arena, Erasmus was like an ant attacking a rhino. You don't go for Luther on this one. And Luther responded the next year with the bondage of the will. Yeah. And uh, he said this in the bondage of the will. He said, Erasmus, you alone have attacked the real issue, the essence of the matter in dispute in the Reformation. You've not wearied me with irrelevancies about the papacy, purgatory, indulgences, and such like trifles, for trifles they are rather than basic issues. Reformation ain't about those things. But yeah, almost everyone hitherto has gone hunting for me without success. Isn't that cool? On that. You, Erasmus, you alone have seen the question on which everything hinges and have aimed for the vital spot for which I sincerely thank you. Right, here we go. (laughs) Now, out came the nine-inch guns, and he absolutely pounded the freedom of the will. Because Luther said, Erasmus has just been so glib about the key issue. Are we able to do anything towards our salvation? And Erasmus goes, what? You just can't be glib about a question like that. And in complete contrast, Luther is adamant, for all we freely choose to do, we never naturally choose to please God. We never do that. Therefore, all our salvation must be God's doing, not ours. Now, When Luther denies free will and talks about the bondage of the will, people really quickly misunderstand him on this one. They go, that's just a mad argument. Free will is just obvious, isn't it? I do what I want to do, yeah? I mean, don't. Free, free will is a no-brainer. But that's not what Luther's talking about. He's not saying we don't do what we want to do. He's saying... My will is so enslaved that whilst I always do what I want to do, I never choose to please God. So my will freely chooses to do all sorts of things, but it's so enslaved to sin that it never is able to choose to please God on its own. Erasmus, on the other hand, is simply saying we're a bit weak-willed. But we, we can genuinely choose to please God on our own, naturally. But Luther says, no, on our own, naturally, our choices will always be sinful. We're spiritually dead. Ephesians 2. Have a look at this. Here's how um, one commentator sums up the difference between the two positions. 
The difference between Erasmus and Luther is shown in the words that the two men used to describe their depressions. Now, both Erasmus and Luther used to have sort of depressions, but they were very different. Luther called his depression Anfechtung. And Anfechtung suggests an assault from without, being tempted, attacked by the devil. And the only hope lay in a conquest from without by Christ, who for us overcame the devil, death and hell. Erasmus called his depressions pusillanimitas. Try saying that three times quickly. Literally, weakness of spirit, faint-heartedness, for which we have the little-used English derivative, pusillanimity. Did I say that right? (laughs) This implies, pusillanimity, implies a weakness within, which man can do something to remedy by pulling himself together. So in Luther's case, moral effort was useless. Not so for Erasmus. Do you see it? Their views of the will. Erasmus says... Basically, we're a bit weak-willed. So pull yourself together, man. Come on. You want to go for salvation? Go for it. Our problem is we're a bit lethargic. Erasmus says, no, your problem is way more serious than that. Your will is enslaved and totally incapable of pleasing God. Now, those differences between them showed in what they wanted to do in reforming a church. Those differences of understanding produced totally different ideas of what it means to reform the church. So, what does Erasmus think reforming the church should look like? Do a bit better. Yeah? Man should do a bit better. Luther says, man can't do any better. Therefore, what's the solution, says Luther? The solution is not try harder. The solution is the all-sufficient grace of God. That's the solution. Try harder, grace of God. It's two distinct options. That's Luther and Erasmus. Let me introduce you to the other key debate of the Reformation. And introduce you to two new guys. Well, one we've met briefly. Um, the one on the left, uh, he's a Frenchman. His name is, well, he was born Jean Covin. Um, it, it's um, Covin, Chauvin, it's the same name, but don't think, he cha- changed his name to Calvin, but don't think Calvinism is Chauvinism, it's, they're different things. Um, but Covin, Chauvin, it's the same word, but he Latinized his name to Calvin. John Calvin, Um, and he led the Reformation the second generation after Luther. Um, By the way, changing his name, uh, everyone did that at the time. This was just the cool thing to do at the time. Um, So uh, Luther was actually born Martin Luder, uh, but he thought Luther sounds a bit more polished. Um, uh, Covin became Calvin. Um, Philip Melanchthon, who is um, uh, Luther's buddy, um, his name wasn't really Melanchthon, it sounds, which sounds fancy, doesn't it? Um, his name was Schwarzerd. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound so good. So, oh, Melanchthon. <laughs> or um, there was another one whose name was Hausschein. And he thought, no, I'll call myself Echolampadius, don't you know? <laughs> so they all, they all did this. And uh, so I would have been called Reevesius. Now, quite seriously, there was a guy like, called, called William Ames who was known as Amesius. <laughs> anyway, they all like doing that at the time. Anyway, he's a Frenchman. Uh, the guy on the left, uh, Corvin. And uh, in France, well, let me tell you en passant um, <laughs> of how, how the Reformation happened in France. For Germany, the key verse was Romans 1.17, yeah? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith in the gospel. In France, the verse that got it all going was Hebrews 7, 27. Do you want to have a look? Well, 
which says that unlike the high priests of the Levitical system of the law, Christ has no need like them to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he offered his sacrifice once for all when he offered up himself. Eh? That's the verse that gets things going in France. Because what the logic of it is, is that Christ's sacrifice is once for all. So if... Christ's sacrifice for sin on the cross was a complete work with no need for any further atonement for sin, then all our attempts to atone for sin by being good boys and girls must be useless, because all sin's been atoned for, and in fact, offensive, in that they say that Christ's work was not complete. Does that make sense? Because Christ's work was complete... Therefore, there's no need to try to add anything to please God more. Do you see? What you say about justification spills out into everything. It affects your view of the cross. It affects your view of who God is. It affects your view of who we are. Do you see already? We're starting to see you have a different view of God. You have a different view of humanity. Individualistic or found in Adam or Christ. You have a different view of how God works. But that was, that was the verse that got things going in France. That on the cross, Christ has completed the work of atonement, which means that all we need do now is trust in Christ and his complete work. Now, anyway, um, I need to tell you a little bit about what uh, Jean did after that. Um, now, what happened is Jean needed to get out of Paris. Things started heating up a bit um, in France. Um, that they started burning people. And, um, and so he needed to get out of France. And he wanted to go from Paris to Strasbourg. There was a nice library in Strasbourg. He was a bit of a geek. Um, and so he wanted to go to Strasbourg. But unfortunately, there were a couple of fairly chunky armies on the road between Paris and Strasbourg. So he decided to take a southern detour uh, and do an overnight stop in Geneva. And he thought, well, that will be lovely. I'll just pop through the Alps, and I'll stop overnight in Geneva, and then carry on to Strasbourg. Now, Geneva had just come over to the Reformation, but it was a bit shaky. And it had come over to the Reformation through the work of the flame-haired and fiery, enormous Guillaume Farel, a scary bruiser of a reformer. And Pharrell heard that Calvin, who was starting to be a bit of a name, was in town. And he thought, oh, we could grab him for Geneva. So he came knocking on Calvin's door. Calvin was absolutely terrified. Um, Calvin managed to squeak something about just wanting to go onto a hushed library in Strasbourg. At which point, Pharrell... I quote Calvin now, Pharrell proceeded to utter an imprecation that God would curse my retirement and the tranquility of the studies which I sought if I should withdraw and refuse to give assistance when the necessity was so urgent. By this imprecation, I was so stricken with terror that I desisted from the journey which I'd undertaken. <laughs> so this, this wild ginger-haired man just said, I curse you if you don't stay here to help the Reformation. All right, all right, all right. So, Calvin stays to help the Reformation in Geneva. Anyway, Calvin really gets into into it and really goes for it on Reformation stuff and pushes the Reformation a bit harder than they really want in Geneva. Because in Geneva, they're kind of going, a little bit of Reformation would be lovely, but we don't want to, you know, we don't want to go wacky, really. You know, we want to be sensible about it. So, after a few years... um, Things start getting more and more tense. And anyway, they say to Calvin, your preaching is now too strong. Stop preaching. You don't tell Calvin to stop preaching. He keeps preaching. So they kick him out of the city. And he goes, excellent. I can carry on to Strasbourg now. So he goes on to Strasbourg. Now, he gets to Strasbourg. When he's out of Geneva in Strasbourg, loads of people thought, "Uh uh-uh, Geneva's now going to flip back to Rome. And one of the guys who thought that Geneva is going to go back to Rome, abandon the Reformation, 
was the guy on the right, Cardinal Jacopo Sadaletto. Now, Sadaletto, he was um, a charming, highly intelligent and learned, and very moderate Catholic. And he thought, just a gentle shove in the right direction, and Geneva will come home to Rome. So what he did is, with Calvin out the way, Sadaletto writes a letter, an open letter to Geneva saying, come on, come back to the mothership. And here's, get this, here's how he starts his letter. Sorry, this isn't to do with justification right now. But here's how he starts his letter. You've just got to hear this. Here, basically, he starts his letter to Geneva with this big verbal hug. He goes, very dear brethren in Christ. You can see a big sort of crucifix or something. Like that. Very dear brethren in Christ, peace to you. And with us, that is the Catholic Church, the mother of all. <laughs> Both us and you. Love and concord from God. And the rest of the letter is all honey and gush to the Genevans. And the reformers, of course, are those crafty men, enemies of Christian unity and peace who try to lead the good Genevans astray. Now, what is the truth, according to Cardinal Jacopo Sadaletto? Cardinal Sadaletto says, we can, I quote, we can be saved by faith alone. What? Huh? A cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church said so we can be saved by faith alone. Oh, right. Well, so the whole debate was over nothing then, eh? And then he just goes on to explain what he means. We can be saved by faith alone. And in this very faith, love is essentially comprehended as the chief and primary cause of our salvation. In this very faith, love is essentially comprehended as the chief and primary cause of our salvation. So, sad letto, salvation by faith alone, really means salvation by our love. And he says, here's the deal. You can either follow what the Catholic Church throughout the world, now for more than 1,500 years, has approved with general consent, or you can follow innovations introduced within these last 25 years. Now, just in case the Genevans have not already been won over by this compelling argument, Sadaletto then dramatically imagines an evangelical and a Catholic before the dread tribunal of the sovereign judge. It's judgment day. Evangelical and Catholic step up. What are they going to say as their defense on judgment day before the Lord? Who's going to get acquitted? Hmm, (laughs) I wonder. Well, obviously the Catholic gets to go first. And the Catholic's defense is this. I am obedient to the Catholic Church and revere its, and observe its laws, admonitions, and decrees. That's his defense. And then the wicked evangelical brazenly steps up. And what's his defense? We have shaken off the tyrannical yoke of the church. Is that what you would say? <laughs> Why did you shake off the tyrannical yoke of the church, evangelical? Well... In order that, listen to this, in order that trusting to this our faith, we might thereafter be able to do with greater freedom whatever we wanted. (laughs) So Sadaletto thinks the evangelicals are saying that justification by faith alone means we trust in our own act of faith. And rather than trusting in Christ. And because we're not really trusting in Christ, we're trusting in our own act of faith. Therefore, we can go and live in a life of self-indulgence because we've not, not really got anything to do with Christ. Guess who wins? Unsurprisingly, of course, the Catholic wins on Judgment Day, is taken to eternal bliss. The evangelical is flicked into outer darkness. Why? Because the Catholic has trusted a church which, Sadaletto says, cannot err. And the evangelical 
has been, he says, trusting to his own head. So Sadlet is thinking, if you're not trusting the church for your salvation, you must be trusting yourself. What other option is there? Get this for his rhetorical questions. He says of the evangelical, to what, listen to this, to what does the evangelical look as the haven of his fortunes? In what stronghold does the evangelical confide? To whom does he trust as his advocate with God? (laughs) He's thinking, no one but himself. It never seems to cross his mind. The answer is, Christ. (laughs) Anyway, the letter ends. He signs off to his dearest brethren and goes. Now, the Genevans, they've kicked Calvin out of Geneva. And then, having received this letter, they go, would you mind responding for us, please? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Calvin's more gracious than I am. He says, all right, then, I'll do it. And um, so he responds. Uh, He does say early on in his letter, he says, it is somewhat suspicious, Sadaletto, that a stranger who never before had any intercourse with Geneva should now suddenly profess for them so great an affection, (laughs) though no previous sign of it existed. Well, anyway, then on to the content. He says, the reformers are not about dividing the church, but reforming it. And this reform, it's not this innovation of the last 25 years. He says, our agreement with the ancient church is far closer than yours, Sadaletto. All we have attempted has been to renew that ancient form of the church. The reformers are absolutely clear and emphatic on that. That the Reformation was about getting back to The pure Christianity of the early church is not a new thing. We're going back to the Bible. Then on to the main bulk of his response. On to justification by faith, the first and keenest subject of controversy between us. Now, the way Calvin argues here is very revealing. Hear this. He says, wherever the knowledge of justification by faith alone is taken away, there the glory of Christ is extinguished. Isn't that an interesting argument? Wherever the knowledge of justification by faith alone is taken away, there the glory of Christ is extinguished. Now, this is key. I want you to see. You need to get this logic of what Calvin's saying, and the logic, really, of all the Reformation. That salvation is a gift of God's grace alone. Sola gratia. And salvation is found not in any pope, not in any doing good works, not in any prayers. It's found in Christ alone. Solus Christus. And it is received, that gift of grace, by simple faith alone. And we know all this for sure only through Scripture. Sola Scriptura. Now, what Calvin and the Reformers are saying is only if all those things are true, the sinner contributing nothing towards his own salvation. Only then can all the glory go to God alone. Soli Deo Gloria. So Reformation thinking had this as its guiding light for all theology. It was the litmus test, as it were. Does your theology lead you to say, to God alone be all the glory? Or... Does it lead you to keep some of the glory for yourself? And Sadaletto's problem, said Calvin, was exactly this. Get this. He says, If the blood of Christ alone is set forth 
as purchasing salvation and cleansing for sins. If the blood of Christ alone does that, how dare you, Sadaletto, presume to transfer so great an honor to your works? See, Sadaletto's half baked idea that salvation is the fruit of both God's grace and man's love actually was a blasphemous denigration of what Christ had done on the cross. It was going right against that key verse that had set the Reformation off in France, Hebrews 7, 27, that Christ sacrifices once for all, and therefore there is no satisfaction left for us to do. And as for the charge that such gratuitous mercy would leave Christians without care for living a holy life, which is what Sadleto had said... Calvin says, actually, that forgets Christ as well, as Sadaletto, you tend to do. He says, listen to the logic of this. Wherever that righteousness of faith, which we say comes by grace alone, wherever that is, there too Christ is. And where Christ is, There too is the spirit of holiness who regenerates the soul to newness of life. Do you see? Again, you must understand it's all about being united with Christ. It's like the king and the prostitute yesterday. That it's being married to the king. Receiving his status, but then being with him and so being transformed by him. Wherever, wherever that righteousness of faith is, there too Christ is. And where Christ is, there too is the spirit of holiness who regenerates the soul to newness of life. Let's pray. Great Lord, would you give us clarity on these things? Would you keep picking away at our hearts so that we are more assured on these things? So that we give no glory to ourselves. We don't trust to ourselves, to our own heads at all, but we trust in Christ alone. And then finding that we are clothed in him, find all security and all comfort in knowing that we come before you, Father, in the beautiful, beautiful robes of righteousness, the clothing of the firstborn. In his name, amen. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalisation. And Newton House Oxford invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.viola.gy.